recording. And, and uh, you want to get it ready to display, and then I'll let everybody in. There we are. Is it dominating your screen? There it is. It's on the on the side. I have it on my other monitor. So I'm letting people in now. So here right. we go. All right. Come right on in, everybody. Welcome to the first Friday lecture for June. And we'll start in just a moment. People, okay, still trickling in from the waiting room. People still, oh, there they come. Okay. Good afternoon and welcome everyone to the first Friday lecture for the month of June. Today's speaker is Claire Pearson, and Claire's title is The Prometheus Myth and the Limits of Technology. Please note that this presentation is being recorded and it will be available on the Graham School YouTube channel if you wanna watch it later. Also, please be aware that you will not be able to unmute your microphones during this presentation as a courtesy to our speaker. You will be able to ask questions in the chat box. You can do so at any time during the presentation. Questions that you type in the chat box, I will keep track of, and then I will pose them to Claire at the end of the lecture during our question and answer period. During the presentation itself, as I say, all will be muted except for our speaker. Claire and I will be able to see your video, but we will not be able to hear you. So if you choose to leave your video on or turn it off, it is at your, dis uh, your discretion. Claire's video will be spotlighted for the most part during the presentation. Consequently, the best way to view the lecture is to select speaker view instead of gallery view. Today's lecture is being sponsored by the basic program of liberal education for adults at the University of Chicago's Graham School. My name is Kendall Sharp, and I am the Cyril O'Hool Chair of the basic program. Before I properly introduce our speaker, I'd like to say a few words about the basic program, the Graham School, and our upcoming courses and events. You can find links to more information in the chat box. The basic program is a four-year certificate program at the University of Chicago's Graham School of Continuing Studies. Graham offers an array of programs besides the basic program. Since 1946, we have offered our students a rigorous liberal arts curriculum based on the principle that there is no substitute for direct engagement with big ideas in their original contexts. Through focused discussion and close reading, our classes provide direct encounters with some of the great works of classical and Western culture in a dedicated community of adult learners led by experienced University of Chicago educated instructors. Uh, registration for summer courses is now open. Our next, our next First Friday lecture will happen late in the summer on September the 1st, and the speaker will be basic program instructor Katya Mitova. Katya's title will be Multiplicity, Kierkegaard, Pessoa, and Borges. Uh, this weekend, we'll see our graduation celebration of students who have completed the four-year certificate. And as I mentioned before, this presentation is being recorded. The recording will be available to uh, uh, on the Graham School uh, YouTube channel early next week. And now let me introduce our lecturer today. Claire Pearson did graduate work with the University of Chicago's Committee on Social Thought and pursues interdisciplinary work, centering especially on ethical questions and experiences. Claire chaired the basic program from 2004 to 2008 and co-designed and chaired the Asian Classics program from 2006 to 2009. Claire received the 2013 Graham School Excellence in Teaching Award. Now it is my pleasure to turn things over to Claire. Thank you, Kendall, and welcome everybody. Thanks for, for coming today. Um, can everyone hear me? Yes. Okay, this screen is a little weird here. So uh, as, you, as you heard, my topic today is the Prometheus myth and the limits of technology. Um, one of the better known figures from Greek mythology in the modern world is the Titan Prometheus, whose name means foreknowledge or forethought, and who steals fire from the gods and gives it to human beings. But most people only know some fairly simplified versions of the actual myths that surround him. Uh, Prometheus was ignored in Western history by European thinkers and artists 
up until the beginning of the 19th century. Uh, and then he suddenly became massively popular. Uh, he was popularized by the Romantics and that popularity has hung on uh, through, through modern times. In poems by Goethe and Byron in a ballet, a Prometheus ballet composed by Beethoven, Percy Shelley's modern version of Prometheus Unbound, and Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, which is subtitled A Modern Prometheus. The figure of Prometheus was used as a spokesman for and a symbol of the constant push for new scientific knowledge and technological innovation. But it was also used for the heroic rejection of tyranny and the radical defense of personal liberty. Percy Shelley goes so far as to compare him with Milton Satan. Uh, in the preface to his play, he comments that the only imaginary being remember, resembling Prometheus in any degree is Satan. And he judges Prometheus to be a much better figure to write about, more poetic, because he exemplifies the highest perfection of moral and intellectual nature. Aeschylus's Prometheus Bound was the direct source for these modern interpretations. And on its face, the play seems to justify both these readings. But while there was a long history of scholars who refused to read Prometheus philosophically on the grounds that Greek religion could not possibly have anything interesting to say to a Christian world, this is an attitude I ran into myself when I was working on Prometheus in the classics department, uh, this position is thankfully dying out and it has been challenged by a significant number of prominent thinkers, both in classics and in comparative literature and in philosophy. Read carefully, it becomes clear that Aeschylus's version of the myth is much more complex and that the popular interpretations of Prometheus, which we find in the modern world, ultimately remove it from its critical Greek context and end up glorifying what the Greeks saw as at best ethically ambivalent. My aim today is to look closely at the Prometheus myth, first in a broad overview, and then more carefully at what Aeschylus in particular does with the god and the myth in Prometheus Bound, which as John Harrington points out in his introduction to the Oxford edition of Prometheus, has to be understood not as a complete work in itself, but as the opening movement of a trilogy of Aeschylus's Prometheia. Using what we know of the lost plays that completed the trilogy and of Aeschylus's work in general, in addition to the other versions of the stories, I will here lay out a more nuanced view of the way that the classical Greek world understood the Prometheus story and with it understood the critical human relationship with technology. The Prometheus myth has come down to us from classical Greek only in a small handful of stories, which actually differ significantly from each other in some areas. But taken together, these give us a sense of certain common characterizations and touchstones. One of the main sources of the primary material or our main sources of the primary material, sorry, in chronological order are Hesiod in both his Theogony and Works and Days, Aeschylus's Prometheus Bound and the fragments that remain of the two plays that followed it, a brief story in Plato's Protagoras, a few brief mentions in the second century BE, BCE Greco-Syrian satirist Lucian, uh, whose contribution is fairly limited, and finally, from the second century CE, pseudo Apollodorus's uh, collections of stories from Greek myth. Hesiod and Ap Apollodorus do not directly engage in the meaning of the gift of fire or in its connection with technology and the attitudes that drive technology. But together they do give us the broad footprint of the myth in two different versions. We also know that Prometheus as a god was not widely worshiped in the Hellenic world. He had minor rights in a few scattered cities, mostly in Attica, um, but he did have his own specific minor religious festival in Athens as the bringer of fire and the source of metallurgy. And he was celebrated with torch races during the Panathenian festival. 
There was an altar dedicated to Prometheus in the Promethean Grove, which stood right outside of Plato's Academy. Broadly speaking, the Prometheus story occupies a particularly interesting place in Greek thought. His specific divine power was tied to the ability to think ahead, to invent and innovate, although he seems in Aeschylus also to have the ability to see the future. His core powers are connected to both Athena and Hephaestus, who are mentioned together with Prometheus in all versions of the myths. When he steals fire to give it to mortals, he also steals Hephaestus's skill as an ingenious craftsman and Athena's ability to strategize, both of which are tied to the meaning of fire for human beings. He's a particular pr protector and benefactor of humankind in all the stories. Uh, and in most versions, a complex figure who's also tied to the creation of human beings. Uh, Prometheus either creates them himself alone or together with his brother, or he rescues them from the plan from planned destruction. In, and it does this in a way that essentially recreates them. In either case, he is responsible for shaping human beings in such a way that the drive for invention and technological advancement is inbuilt into human nature and eventually allows them to vie even with the gods. His actions here bring him into conflict with Zeus, who we need to remember is not only the ultimate ruler of the gods, but also particularly associated with cosmic balance and civic justice, as well as with ethical behavior in the treatment of strangers and guests. Given that we're dealing with the primary god in Zeus, who's responsible for the balance of the cosmos, Prometheus's challenge to Zeus and conflict with him can't be left to stand, but has to be resolved. But it is also a critical issue, which at least as far as human beings are concerned, remains in human nature always in a certain tension with society around it. The gift of fire as a theft from the gods and as defiance of divine power and a transformation of human nature is the core of the Prometheus story, but the Greeks cannot simply celebrate it. It stands in inher inherent tension with the fundamental Greek religious and ethical perspective on the larger world, which we find conveyed in tragedy. Based on what we know about Greek religion and about the structure of myths in general, which often deal with what a culture perceives to be critical core paradoxes and contradictions that human beings must always work on and can never completely resolve, it makes sense to see the focal point of the myth precisely in this conflict between the human drive to develop technology without limit on the one hand and the good of human beings and society on the other. In the versions of the story we have, only Aeschylus gives us a rich enough telling to situate the meaning of the story in that conflict. Although given that parts of his trilogy are lost or partially lost, in order to reconstruct that, we have to draw on the themes Aeschylus develops in Prometheus Bound and in the Fragments, on what we know about Aeschylus's views and way of working, and about the myth in Greek religion generally. The earliest source of the Prometheus myth that we find in Hesiod gives us a version that treats Prometheus simply as a minor trickster god, who's well-intentioned toward human beings, but ultimately a source of grief. His version also significantly conflicts to some degree with later material or with other versions of the myth. Hesiod frames his tale with conventional and fairly simplistic piety, and he does not invite either philosophical or theological speculation. The Oxford classicist Hugh Lloyd-Jones remarks, that one has to be a little careful in taking Hesiod as a guide to the nature of men's beliefs and their attitudes to the gods. His manner is that of a peasant poet writing for peasants. So much for Hesiod. Um, <laughs> nevertheless, the story as Hesiod tells us does give us an important background. In both the texts where he talks of Prometheus, this story is brief and it seems to be primarily a vehicle for the Pandora story which tells about the creation of women as a punishment for Prometheus's actions and as an evil to mankind, an aspect which he tells with gusto and a misogyny that stood out 
even in the ancient world. Um, Lucian has a few satirical quips on this issue. The basic details of the story are the same in both texts. In the Theogony, the Prometheus story is embedded in an accounting of Zeus's punishment of the Titans who fought against him in his takeover of the cosmos from his father, Kronos. Hesiod briefly describes Prometheus's punishment first. Uh, Zeus has him nailed to a cliff in the Caucasus and sends an eagle to rip out his liver daily. It regrows every night. And he adds then that Prometheus will eventually be set free by Her Her Heracles. And Zeus knows this, but allows it to happen because he supports Heracles's fame. Hesiod then explains that the punishment that is visited on Prometheus arises from a conflict with Zeus over a trick Prometheus makes in order to give human beings the better portion of sacrifice. Prometheus, intending to give the human beings the meat, divides up the sacrifice into two portions. One uh, gives us the bones wrapped in fat, and the other gives us the meat wrapped in the hide of the bull. And then he gives Zeus his choice. Zeus in Hesiod's story both sees through the trick, but still chooses the one wrapped in fat and then gets angry at Prometheus for this. As a consequence, he takes fire away from human beings who in this version are presumed to already have it. His reasoning seems to be to prevent them from being able to sacrifice at all since he ended up with the smaller portion. When Prometheus steals fire and gives it back to human beings, Zeus immediately responds by having Hephaestus create a, quote, evil thing as the price for fire. This is Pandora, the first woman. Apparently, all human beings up till then are male. Athena adorns her, and Hesiod goes on to explain why women are a curse on mankind. The same story is repeated with a slight difference in Works and Days, where Prometheus is mentioned in the context of explaining why human beings have to work so hard for a living. Here, after telling about Pandora's creation, we get the story known as Pandora's box. When Pandora is completely created, the gods stand in awe at this wonderful great evil that Zeus has ordered, and every god contributes a plague for mortals, which they put into a jar and give to Pandora. Then she's brought to Prometheus's brother Epimetheus as a gift, knowing that Epimetheus is not very thoughtful, and of course, he takes her and she accidentally re releases the plagues into the world with only hope kept inside the jar and thus accessible to human beings. Um, the moral of this tale, as Hesiod specifically tells us, is that there's no way to escape the will of Zeus as the punishment of both humanity and Prometheus shows us. He follows this with the story of the five ages of the world, which start with a descent from a golden age. In each age, Zeus successively creates different and steadily worse versions of the human race. Um, the current world full of strife and trouble being the, the fifth and worst. There's several things worth noting in the Hesiod story. First, his main concern throughout is to present Zeus as the ultimate god and to interpret the origin of human troubles as coming from challenges to Zeus's power and from the ordained decline of the ages. Unlike what we find in other versions, Prometheus is presented as a foolish and negative character. And while he seems to genuinely want to help human beings, he only succeeds in bringing misery upon both himself and them since Zeus, for reasons that are not explained, chooses to punish human beings for Prometheus's trick. Prometheus has no special knowledge or foresight in Hesiod's story. At least he doesn't foresee Zeus's reaction. Despite his piety, Hesiod presents Zeus simplistically with either petty or unscrutable, inscrutable motivations behind his actions. In addition to, in addition to worship, he seems primarily interested in the origin stories of the human condition. 
there are some signs that Hesiod might have forced the myth to fit his goals, since there are contra clear contradictions even in his, in his retelling. For example, Zeus sees through the sacrifice trick, but also falls for it and gets angry at it. He responds to getting the worst portion of the sacrifice by stopping sacrifice altogether. More importantly, and unlike the clear thread running through all the other versions of the Prometheus myth, the theft of fire is here entirely downplayed and made meaningless by the claim that people originally had fire. So Hesiod's Prometheus has nothing significant to do with shaping human nature and destiny. <coughs> Excuse me. Hephaestus and Athena only peripherally are involved through the creation of Pandora and human beings are kept in their place with Zeus remaining solidly unthreatened and in control. So much for Hesiod. Apollodorus in his later collections retells a somewhat different series of myths reconnected with Prometheus. <coughs> beginning with his role in the birth of Athena, uh, a story that we don't have elsewhere. After Zeus rapes Metis and she becomes pregnant, Prometheus hear, uh, Zeus hears a prophecy that her second child will come to be a, the ruler of heaven, and so he swallows her. Prometheus, and in some versions Hephaestus, takes an ax to Zeus's head and releases Athena fully formed and in armor. Zeus is miraculously unharmed. This again pairs Prometheus with both Hephaestus and Athena. Apollodorus's version of the theft of fire is extremely brief and doesn't explicitly connect fire with technology, but he adds that Prometheus originally created humankind, molding them out of earth and water, and after that stole fire to give to them for which he was nailed to the cliff in the Caucasus by Zeus's order as his punishment and mentioning also the eagle that is set upon him to, to eat his liver. Apollodorus also adds a story that connects Prometheus to Deucalion, who is a kind of Greek Noah who repopulates the earth after, his, after um, a vast flood kills almost everybody. Deucalion is said to be Prometheus's son who marries his cousin Pyrrha, who is the daughter of Epimetheus and Pandora. During the Bronze Age, Zeus decides to wipe out humanity and create a, good, a great flood, but Deucalion and Pyrrha escape by floating away in a large chest. When the flood is over, he sacrifices to Zeus, who then grants um, Deucalion and Pyrrha the ability to create new people to populate the world by throwing stones that turn into men and women as they land. Finally, Apollodorus tells the story of how Prometheus is ultimately rescued by Hercules, Heracles during his labors. Heracles accidentally wounds the centaur Chiron and Prometheus, who confusingly in Apollodorus's account is said to be originally mortal, a detail that's at odds with his status as a titan. Prometheus trades his mortality for Chiron's immortality so that Chiron can die and not suffer endless pain from his wound. When Heracles passes through the Caucasus, he sees Prometheus and immediately shoots the eagle and breaks the chains that bind the god. Prometheus's response to this is to advise him how to get the golden apples of the Hesperides, the labor that he's currently working on, which grow in a grove guarded by the daughters of Atlas, grant immortality, and are guarded by a snake. We see loose resonances throughout Apollodorus's retelling with Near Eastern and biblical myths. Apollodorus gives us the simple stories without any interpretation, and there's no larger discussion of Prometheus's conflict with Zeus or how it's resolved once he is free. With that background in mind, and I, it's, it's a, a lot of different threads, so I hope not too confusing, we can move into the more philosophical engagement with the story that we find in es Aeschylus and to a small degree also later in Plato. Most scholars take Aeschylus's three Prometheus plays, the Promethea, to be a trilogy on the model of the Oresteia. 
This trilogy begins with Prometheus Bound, which opens dramatically with the god himself being chained to the cliff by Hephaestus by, by order of Zeus and with the help of strength and violence, henchmen of Zeus. We hear him tell his own story of the theft of fire and his argument with Zeus in dialogue first with a chorus that is made up of the daughters of Ocean, the Titan Okeanos, one of the oldest gods, and later with Okeanos himself. Then the tormented and hounded Io comes on the scene and hears the story. And at the end, Hermes shows up to force Prometheus to reveal what he knows about Zeus's future. When Prometheus refuses, the cliff collapses and Prometheus is hurled into Tartarus where the eagle will arrive to attack him every third day. The second play, Prometheus Loosed, usually translated as Prometheus Unbound, was lost. But we know from surviving fragments that Prometheus has been returned to the light and is back chained to the same cliff. The play has a chorus of Titans, children of earth who had fought against Zeus, which Zeus has now pardoned and also released from Tartarus. They visit Prometheus and again, he describes his suffering and the benefits he's given to human beings which includes teaching them to tame horses, donkeys, and oxen to serve them as slaves and relieve their toil. Earth herself, the oldest and first goddess, then arrives on the scene to visit him, followed by Heracles, who comes and breaks the shackles and kills the eagle. Uh, again, in Aeschylus's story, Prometheus then tells Heracles how to get the Hesperides, to the Hesperides and describes the lands in between in great detail, gives advice on how to trick Atlas so that he can get his hands on the apples and then warns him of the dangers he'll face on the way home. The second play parallels the structure of the first play. Uh, although we have shifted from gods associated with water to gods associated with the earth, and though the re release of the Titan chorus and the change in Prometheus's circumstances strongly suggests that there's been something of a significant change in Zeus's attitude and his way of ruling in the intervening millennia. We also know that the second play does not fully free Prometheus. Prometheus himself tells the chorus that he will be free, quote, when Zeus decides. This leaves the full cosmic resolution with Zeus to be worked out in the final play. This critical third play called Prometheus Firebearer was also lost. And unfortunately we know next to nothing about it, but we do have enough information to make some reasonable educated guesses based on the structure Aeschylus sets up in his first two plays, the themes he invokes as well as Aeschylus's work in general, especially looking to the Oristia, which seems to mimic the same structure. David Green in his interpretation of Prometheus gives good guidance on this. He describes Aeschylus as a great self-conscious teacher, one who has come to certain conclusions as to man's destiny and the divine government of the cosmos. As distinct from Euripides' interest in solution, a solutionless presentation of intellectual problems, Aeschylus is concerned to give a positive theology, which he conceives of as having universal significance. So the myth is for him the illustration of a great permanent truth, which he finds at the heart of man's activity. His dramatic imagination seizes on such truths as are frequently a compromise between two opposites. And consequently, the myths he uses most are those which tell of conflict on a cosmic scale and of conflict ultimately laid by and mediated by some concessions on the part of both combatants. It's also been assumed quite reasonably that the play in some way deals with the establishment of the Prometheus festival and Prometheus worship in Athens. This would follow the model of the Oristia, which is partly about the founding of the Areopagus. Based on this parallel, the first two plays would develop a critical conflict that must be reconciled in a third. 
Here, possibly mediated by Athena, we would expect a scene where Zeus and Prometheus reconcile their battle over human beings and Prometheus is restored to the pantheon. At the beginning of the first play, Prometheus himself refers to a reconciliation that will at least partly involve information Prometheus can give Zeus to ultimately save him from a marriage that would result in his being overthrown by his son. This is clearly important, but for Aeschylus, any re resolution would also have to be tied to the fate and development of human beings and would have to involve some concession and change on the part of Prometheus as well as of Zeus. A careful look at the themes that Aeschylus develops early in the trilogy suggests something of the larger context of this resolution. In Prometheus Bound, we're immediately presented with a picture of a young Zeus who is new to rule and tyrannical. This is Prometheus's view, which he articulates frequently, loudly, and at length, but it's to a degree backed up by the presence of strength and violence who are portrayed as arrogant bullies and by Hephaestus who voices real discomfort in carrying out Zeus's order and complains that Zeus is hard-hearted because he is new to power. The chorus also ex e echoes this judgment later and the appearance of Io is initially another vision of Zeus's abuse of power. Hephaestus calls Prometheus lofty-minded son of Themis, good counselor, and tells him that he is chaining him against his will, forced into it by Zeus. But he also criticizes him for giving mortals divine gifts against the will of the gods, notice the plural, and therefore not just against the will of Zeus. Aeschylus does something interesting here that's perhaps a small but significant hint of what's to come. He identifies Prometheus's mother, who in other versions is given variously as the nymph Clumene or as Gaia or Asia, as Themis. Themis, whose name means established custom and comes from a word that also connects to debt, is the older Titan goddess associated with justice in the sense of traditional rules and customs that determine our obligation to others and tell us how to deal with wrongdoing. A significant power widely worshiped in Greece, she's also a former wife of Zeus and their children include the fates. The connection between Themis and Zeus makes sense as a marriage between the old forms of justice and the newer forms that Zeus brings with laws and court systems. Themis is also portrayed as living peacefully with the Olympian gods and being seated beside the throne of Zeus himself. By identifying Prometheus as a son of Themis and tied to Zeus, Aeschylus introduces the issue of justice early on, laying the ground for a reconciliation that brings the ideas of justice and obligation and of the human community into play. Returning to the play, Prometheus's story comes out only gradually. He first reveals that he's advised the Titans, that he originally advised the Titans to support Zeus in his overthrow of Kronos, but they refused. He himself then joined with Zeus and helped him. Later, he adds that he was the one who helped Zeus structure the new arrangement of powers and possibly also of the punishments meted out to the Titans. As Prometheus sees it, Zeus is in his debt, and his punishment is a violation of justice. He goes on to say that once Zeus established his new order of gods, he decided to entirely wipe out the human race and create a new one. But he, Prometheus, pitied mortals and saved them from destruction. The chorus is tentatively supportive of this, but they clearly think Prometheus is not quite giving them the whole story. Through a gentle interrogation, Prometheus starts slowly admitting to three significant things. First, he caused mortals to lose their foresight of their own death. Next, that he achieved this by placing in them blind hopes. And lastly, that he gave them fire. Uh, from which they shall learn many skills. The chorus's re immediate reaction is that blind hopes is a great gift 
And when he mentions the gift of fire, they express amazement of the, at the idea that these ephemera, the creatures of a day, now possess fire. They also pointedly tell him that he has done wrong, though in their compassion, they're reluctant to criticize him while he's suffering. It's worth noticing here that taking away human beings' prior deep knowledge of personal mortality and replacing it with blind hopes gets particular stress. This seems to be a necessary source of the desire and persistence people need to actually master the technological skills entailed in the gift of fire and to develop its inherent potential. Necessity is the mother of invention, and in order to create solutions to pressing problems that people, people have to believe that these solutions are in reach, worth the long work they will take, and capable of changing things. Um, his answer here also echoes the Pandora story, where the jar leaves only hope left to human beings after the evils are set loose into the world. In contrast with Prometheus's first two gifts, the ethical, oh, in, I lost a sentence here, sorry. Um, this vision which of Prometheus's gifts, which he presents here, is in contradiction to the ethical perspective that comes from tragedy and demands precisely that people need to develop self-knowledge and be fully aware of their own limitations and of their mortality. Uh, through this awareness, they moderate their goals and develop an attitude of acceptance and respect. Replacing awareness of mortality with blind hopes shifts human psychology in a way that allows them to progress by pushing relentlessly against limitations. And at the same time, it grounds this product, progress in a lack of genuine self-knowledge that becomes or at least fosters hubris. When Okeanos comes on the scene, portrayed as a kindly old would-be advisor, a little bit sententious, rather Polonius-like, he accuses Prometheus himself of hubris. He advises him to learn to know how to help himself, and he offers to make, help him make peace with Zeus. When Prometheus refuses his offer, he replies that he needs to learn humility and accuses him of being able to advise others well, but not himself. After a heated argument where Prometheus remains stubbornly defiant, Okeanos gives up and leaves. Okeanos is not here a particularly admirable figure, but his criticisms of Prometheus are echoed repeatedly in the play. Um, every complaint that Prometheus makes of Zeus especially that he is arrogant, stubborn, and self-willed, and foolish and unjust in being arrogant, stubborn, and self-willed, is echoed by those who visit Prometheus, although generally they deliver their criticisms rather more gently. As the chorus starts to mourn for him and to call the whole world to join with them in sympathy, Prometheus cuts them off and then adds more detail to his earlier story. Here we get from him what can only be seen as an evolutionary, evolutionary tale of human self-determined development and advancement, very much in tension with Hesiod's story of declining ages. Prometheus describes humanity as originally unseeing and ignorant, without understanding or skill, living in caves under the ground like swarming ants, unable even to tell the seasons. He claims to have taught them astronomy, mathematics, writing, to have first taught them to domesticate animals and to build boats, and devised all kinds of inventions. And then he complains that he has no invention to get himself out of trouble before continuing the list of things he's taught to mortals. These include medicine, prophecy, knowledge of birds, and metallurgy, ending with the boast that every skill possessed by humankind comes from Prometheus. The chorus at this again grieves for him, but this time they also express the wish never to be like him. And they tell him again that he overvalues humankind who will never be able to help him in his troubles. Aeschylus later makes it clear that Prometheus will remain chained to the cliff for a period of 30,000 years 
This is a substantially longer span than in any other version of the myth. And the audience who of course knows the Heracles story knows that in time, human beings, in, in that time, human beings will develop and eventually will, it will be a godlike human being that will undo Zeus's punishment and set him physically free. This physical freeing does not yet resolve the conflict with Zeus, which of course waits for the third play. The list of powers that Prometheus says he's taught to humankind and the way human beings use these to gradually develop themselves from insect-like beings to beings who can challenge the god themselves is reflected in a very similar form in the Ode to Man from so Sophocles' Antigone. While it's possible that both of these reflect a larger cultural story, it seems equally likely that Sophocles may be directly taking up Aeschylus's story. Most classicists agree that Prometheus Bound was probably performed shortly after Aeschylus died, placing it in 455 or more likely 454, a performance so Sophocles is certain to have attended. Antigone was written and likely performed about 10 to 12 years after this. The Sophoclean ode explores human beings' powers, laying them out as things they discovered or invented for themselves in an evolutionary pattern. These powers, which include agriculture, shipbuilding and sailing, domesticating wild animals, learning speech and healing diseases, overlap almost directly with the powers Prometheus says he taught to humankind. More importantly, the Sophoclean ode presents human beings as only ambiguously good. These abilities themselves are said to make human beings not only strange, terrible, and awe-inspiring, but the strangest, most terrible, and awe-inspiring thing in the world. Uh, the quali these qualities are all translations of the single Greek word dinos, which means all of these things simultaneously. Heidegger suggests translating it as uncanny and uncanniest combining its disturbing quality with admiration and amazement. Sophocles' ode from the very beginning shows human activity to be both amazingly powerful and ethically dubious in its unwillingness to respect barriers and limits. Among human accomplishments are the paradoxical and impious ability to wear out the earth, who is referred to as the greatest of gods, ageless and unwearied. Human accomplishments also include the creation of cities, but in the final verse, the chorus voices a judgment on the man who in his ambition will not respect the laws of the city and the God's sworn rights. They banish such a person as inherently dangerous. With this ending, the ode puts technological advancement at odds with the needs of human community and with both piety and justice presenting a complex tension and conflict between the force embodied by Prometheus and that embodied by the fundamental power of Zeus. The ode suggests that while human beings naturally push against limits in ways that are often powerfully useful, wisdom and the good of the community require them to accept the boundaries that law and religion places on this activity and on this ambition. In Plato's dialogue, Protagoras, Protagoras tells his listeners, who include Socrates, a short version of the Prometheus myth that resonates with this view of things. He describes how the human race uses the gifts of Prometheus to survive at first living in the wild where they were destroyed by beasts because their art was only sufficient to provide them with the means of life and they did not as yet have the art of government. After a while, the desire for self-preservation gathers them into cities but once they gather together, again, having no art of government, they do evil to one another and again find themselves in danger of being dispersed and destroyed. Zeus feared that the entire race would be exterminated. And so he sent Hermes to them to bring the gifts of reverence and justice and to be the ordering principles of the city and the bonds of friendship and reconciliation. The story Protagoras tells is largely faithful to other versions of the myth and suggests a kind of reconciliation that seems critical to what Aeschylus appears to be aiming for, 
where the powers of Prometheus and Zeus are brought into a convergent compromise and the inappropriate use of invented craft now inherent in human beings as a defining quality can be kept in check both by law and religion. The third section of Prometheus Bound offers some potential insight into another aspect of the needed reconciliation. In this section, Io appears on stage tormented by the gadfly. Io is the daughter of Inachus, a river god who lives in the area of Argos. She herself is a minor divinity, a nymph associated with a stream. All the deities who come to Prometheus in this play are associated with water. Zeus has attempted to seduce her, and when she refuses, he forces her father Inachus to drive her from her home. She's turned into a cow, and afterwards tormented by Hera in the form of the hundred-eyed herdsman Argus, and once he dies by a gadfly that gives her no rest and drives her through the world in a seemingly endless and frenzied trek. She appears on the stage in the shape of a horned girl and tells her story to the chorus, hearing from Prometheus the tale of her future wanderings and its eventual end in Egypt. It's not immediately obvious why Io is there other than as another example of, abuse, of Zeus's abuse of power. In the story as she tells it, Hera is not mentioned, though the chorus clearly know that she's a part of it. But Io's appearance in the play is more meaningful than it seems. Io is destined to be the ancestor of many of the most important heroic human beings in early Greek myth, including eventually Heracles. What looks at first to be simple torture results later in a plan by which Zeus plays a role in creating the civilizations of both Greece and Egypt and eventually creates and shapes the heroic age. Instead of destroying human beings, he opts to contribute to shape human life and history. And he does so in a way that clearly suggests that Zeus himself is not a static figure, but that he evolves along with the world to become the key God for human civilization. Io's wanderings will eventually end when she arrives, arrives in Egypt where Zeus, who does not rape her, will touch her gently to calm her frenzy and bring her back to her senses. And by that touch alone, will engender her son Epaphos, who will be the founder of the kingdom of Egypt. In time, their descendants will come back to Argos in the form of women fleeing a marriage with their cousins. And one of these women will give birth to a line of heroes and kings. Um, this is the story that Aeschylus had recently dramatized in The Suppliant Maidens. Um, Io is tied to Prometheus's release, but only as mediated by Zeus himself acting as a co-creator of human civilization. It's worth noting that Heracles himself is a son of Zeus. We can conclude that Aeschylus's final play gives us a reconciliation that involves a changed Zeus grown from the young tyrant that opposed humanity to a God who expresses pity and compassion and eventually becomes a co-creator of humanity and who moderates the dangers of Prometheus's gifts by complementing them and where necessary checking them with his gifts of justice, respect for the vulnerable and in general of ethical thinking. Zeus gives human beings principles by which they governed their communities and a political system of law and justice to resolve conflict and check misguided or misapplied ambition. The tension between the drive for advancement and the respect for law and community remains inherent in human nature, but we have the ability to recognize limits and mediate ambition. Far from giving us a Prometheus figure who stands for radical personal liberty in the pursuit of knowledge and technology, for individualism, and for throwing off the shackles both of governmental authority and of religion in principled rebellion, this is Shelley's version of Prometheus, Aeschylus's Prometheus points to a timeless human problem and stresses that the need to check the drive for technological advancement with ethical attitudes and political laws for the ultimate good of the community and potentially of the world takes precedence. 
In his article, Zeus, Prometheus, and Greek Ethics, Lloyd-Jones argues that instead of being surpassed by modern culture and religion, Greek religion in general, and Aeschylus's Prometheus in particular, have something significant to teach the modern world. In a world as the Greeks understand it, where everything constantly evolves, including the gods themselves, nature itself, and human beings themselves, human beings must recognize and acknowledge the inherent limits of their ability to be certain about the world around them or about the gods or what the gods demand from them. This uncertainty itself does not deny or put a stop to technological advancement, but it acts as a necessary check on the drive to master everything around us, a drive that by itself would be both hubristic and tyrannical. The fundamental attitude toward the world is one of humility, which also results in respect for others and respect for the larger world in general. Thanks to their religion, Lloyd-Jones argues, the Greeks before Plato were in the fortunate position of being free from the illusion that there is only one answer to every ethical question and that the universe is so constituted that human reason can penetrate all its secrets. It's this message that Aeschylus's Prometheus ultimately gives us. Thank you. Thank you, Claire. And uh, we have a number of uh, questions from the chat. And um, uh, 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 folks in the audience, if you want to add questions to the chat, um, I will um, I'll uh, pass them along to Claire. Um, 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 after we get through these, it uh, looks like I have uh, uh, five. Uh, the first one uh, comes from uh, Robert Riva, who asks, back to what was said at the beginning, um, uh, isn't the structure of the Greek Prometheus story just that of the Hebrew Satan story turned on its head, from hero to man to its corrupter, even if each elides partly into shared nuance with the other? Uh, that's a great question. It's something that has stood out to a lot of people. Uh, there's no direct evidence for a clear connection between them, but multiple aspects of the Prometheus story echo things that we find in Genesis and in the Hebrew stories in general. Um, and the parallel is in some ways striking, although Prometheus is not demonized here in this outcome, far from it. Um, interestingly enough, when I was trying to, when I was researching this question and trying to find out whether there was any scholarly background that would justify a connection here, um, the classics page on one of the major universities, and I think it was Columbia, but I'm not 100% trusting my memory on this, translated the normal reference to Prometheus, Prometheus Firebearer, as Prometheus Lightbringer. Lightbringer in Latin is, of course, Lucifer. So, and I suspect this being a classics page, they did that on purpose. Um, the term light bringer in Rome, in, in Roman culture, was used to apply to the morning star Venus, but the morning star Venus was actually depicted as a man carrying a torch. So there are all kinds of interesting echoes here. Um, Prometheus presents himself potentially as, you know, a clear model for at least Milton's Satan, although I don't think Milton turned to Prometheus for this. Again, we don't have any direct evidence of it. But some people have argued that Milton's Satan is a version of this trapped in a monotheistic world where the ethical choices are black and white. So uh, it's an intriguing question. That's all I can give you on it. Thanks, Claire. Thanks, Robert. Um, the next question comes from Sheila Barrett. Uh, Sheila asks, is there an analogy between Prometheus and Adam? 
That's an interesting question. I don't think so, because with respect to the Hebrew creation story, Prometheus is really in the position of God at the beginning. He takes clay and water and shapes and makes human beings. Um, he does guard over them and benefit them, but he himself is not human. Um, he gives human beings his own fundamental qualities. We can say that he shapes human beings in his own image. And later, Zeus has to add something of his image to that. Thank you, Claire. Thank you, Sheila. The next question comes from Rebecca Wilhoft. And Rebecca asks, to bring this into contemporary storytelling, do you see a resemblance between Prometheus and Batman? Batman <laughs> also Batman also creates technology, armor, flying cars, and protects Gotham. Uh, he is always punished for his efforts. I have never given that one any thought. It's kind of intriguing. Um, I'd have to think about it, but I would say that a lot of modern superhero figures seem to be shaped in Prometheus's image to some degree. Um, but I, I, I can't really say much more about that. Thank you, Claire. Um, thank you, Rebecca. Oh, well, actually, so the next question is also from Rebecca. Is there um, also a relationship between the fire that Prometheus gave to humans and biotechnology and the dubious gift of AI that science has given us? And Ross Bagby adds, Rebecca's point would tie to the Frankenstein story and the mot motif of hubris. Yeah, um, there is no question that the gift of fire and the whole litany of skills that um, Prometheus adds to that is meant to is meant to embody the drive of human beings to master their world through technological innovation. Um, I think that's made clear in a lot of ways in the stories in the story that Prometheus himself tells of his gift. Um, and there have been a number of thinkers, both philosophical and literary, who have suggested that our modern world has ad adopted aspects of philosophy that feed this kind of technological drive for development and control and dropped away all the other aspects of the Greek world that serve to mitigate that. Um, Heidegger writes on this, uh, Levinas takes it up briefly in passing when he makes his argument that we need a completely new way of thinking about ethics in modernity. Um, so 100% there. Thank you, Claire. Uh, thank you, uh, Rebecca uh, and uh, and Ross. And then the next question is from Ross, an independent question, Ross Bagby, uh, asks, um, how key to Greek religion was the possibility of Zeus being overthrown in his own turn? Aristophanes does several comic versions of that prospect, for example. Thanks, Ross. It doesn't seem to play into religion very directly, although there are places where Zeus to some degree gets challenged. For instance, you can make the argument that the Dionysus cult presents a certain kind of challenge to Zeus's ultimate supremacy. Dionysus, we should also remember, is a son of Zeus. Um, Nietzsche picks this up and runs with it. Um, for the most part, I think what it contributes to is, is the aspect that Lloyd-Jones has mentioned, that uh, it contributes to the idea that we don't have knowledge of the gods of the world or as of the future, except in partial and possibly temporary forms. Um, 
that perhaps is the most important kind of knowledge that we can have. You know, we it fits into Socrates's, I know that I don't know, um, in the whole role of the humility and understanding that we don't have a grasp on the ultimate reality of things or on the ultimate good and bad that we sometimes think that we have. Thanks, Claire. Um, thanks, Ross. Uh, the next question is from Kenneth Murray. And Kenneth asks, if it is hubristic to try to understand everything, do you have any guidance about what we should not try to understand? <laughs> Well, I think some things have to be clear to us in the modern world. If we look at the advancement of technology and at where we are particularly now, um, it's certainly easy to see that while it has solved a lot of problems that human beings face and in many ways made human life much easier and more comfortable, it's also created problems in its wake. Um, we're now getting psychological studies of kids' use of social media, where we are told that the brain is getting rewired and that attention spans are becoming shorter, the ability to think through problems are impacted by that, and the need for social affirmation is increased. Um, we know that technology has given us the ability to develop destructive weapons that kill from a distance at a mass level and could potentially destroy the earth. Um, and of course, it's hard not to invoke Frankenstein when thinking about where AI is going. When when the very creators of AI are saying, we're terrified of this, it could destroy us, but we're going to do it anyway. Um, where, what are we left to do? Uh, most likely, their plea is to be, is for a law that will relieve them of liability for any damage that is done. But what Aeschylus's version of Prometheus would actually suggest is that before we engage in certain avenues of scientific development and inquiry, we find some way to really ethically think through the consequences of it. And we have the political courage to limit overreach in these areas for the good of human beings. Thank you, Claire. And thank you, Kenneth. The next question comes from Tracy Marks. Tracy asks, if the Greeks did view Prometheus as the creator of mankind, why was he not given a more central place in Greek thought? Was this in part because Greek religion was God-centered, as was Christianity, and we were not yet fully in a humanistic age? And of course, Prometheus was at odds with Zeus, dot, 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 dot. <laughs> um, I think the real answer to why Prometheus isn't given a much more central role is that in Greek religious thought, it's important to recognize that human beings are creatures of a day, that we live short lives, that we we will die and be forgotten. Uh, and all of our attempts to fight that, to gain some form of immortality, ultimately fail. You can think of Achilles in, in the Iliad, who has chosen a short life with glory so that he will be godlike and be remembered, who later when he talks with Odysseus in the Odyssey, says, wrong choice. I should have chosen a long life on the, uh, on, on the land as a slave to some man rather than king over all the perished dead. Um, what's regularly pounded in in Greek religion 
is that we can't overestimate our own importance, um, despite the natural tendency to do so. That we're better off if we have a more honest and balanced assessment of ourselves and we don't try to basically conquer the world. I think there was a second part to that that I might not have answered. <laughs> Uh, let's see, was this in part because Greek religion was God-centered and we were not yet fully in a humanistic age? Is that the part that was? Okay, part? I don't really think it was quite so God-centered because ultimately once human beings develop, um, the gods themselves are constantly interacting with human beings. It's not humanistic uh, in the later sense because Greek, you know, at least pre-Platonic Greek thought rejects the idea of universal answers and universal knowledge that will solve things. Um, the Prometheus story is, is, I think, a part of that. Thank you, Claire. Thank you, Tracy. The next question is from Norm Ryan. And Norm asks, this may be too simple a question, uh, but it's not. Prometheus did not create fire, but stole it from Zeus. Did Zeus create fire? Or were there other gods who also had fire from whom Prometheus might have stolen it? Fire is one of the original elements that potentially pre-exist the gods themselves. Um, we, we're not really told what, where fire comes from. We start with a view of the universe where um, Uranus, heaven, and Gaia, earth, emerge as the first gods out of some original thing that cannot be explained. <laughs> um, and fire already belongs to the heavens and the earth. Uh, Zeus controls, when he comes into power, he controls a certain form of it in the lightning, but fire isn't his invention and it's not completely under his control. Fire in the larger sense that um, goes along with the fire that Prometheus gives to human beings more properly belongs to Hephaestus, who uses it to, for metallurgy and inventive crafts. Um, it's embedded in the structure of nature, I would say. Thank you, Claire. Thank you, Norm. Uh, the next question comes from Ben Yang, and Ben asks, um, what can make us foresee enough the consequences of uh, technological and scientific development? That question feels like a bit of a trap. <laughs> <laughs> um, because if the answer is that the curb to overreach in technological development and in the attempt for, of, for tech, to technologically control and tame nature is precisely our recognition that we don't and can't fully understand these things and we can't fully predict the consequences. Um, so that ought to make us wary. <laughs> that ought to make us very circumspect about ad advancing in new directions, which could be radical. Thank you, Claire. Um, thank you, Ben. And then the, uh, the final question that has come in is from um, Kenneth Murray again. And Ken asks, how do you balance the benefits of trying to limit te technology with the risks, for example, of evildoers gaining the power you have uh, yourself forsworn? Well, for one, you don't leave the question of what science and technology gets developed in the hands of the market. <laughs> um, that would be anathema to Greek thinking. Um, by its very nature, that embeds itself in a system which is basically a form of power seeking. And uh, 
it remains to some degree out of the reach of political and ethical attempts to control it. Uh, you would want to set limitations, set legal limitations, um, set a bar. Uh, I think, you know, I think of things like the FDA in America. Um, we have to prove to some degree that drugs that are approved help human beings for certain conditions, even though sometimes the the rate at which they help them is very small. The European version of this sets a much higher bar. Um, also for banning chemicals, in order to follow certain certain science and certain chemical or certain um, lines of deploying chemicals in various ways, we have to first prove that they don't do harm to the environment and to people. Um, the United States does not do that. We assume that they can be used unless it can be proven that they're harmful. Um, and it's worth saying that the Greeks would probably lean much more to setting certain developmental bars and surrounding the development and use with certain scientific and ethical questions. That's probably not enough of an answer, but part of the nature of this problem is that we can't ever answer it fully and completely that we have to wrestle with this forever. But if we come down purely on one side or the other, we're going to be in trouble. Um, thank you, Claire. And um, that, is, uh, that is it for the uh, question and answer. Um, and I am now, there we are. I've enabled everyone to unmute yourselves. So you may applaud, join me in applauding. Uh, Claire's great lecture. Claire, thank you so much. Okay. <laughs> and there we are. All righty, everybody. Thank you so much for uh, coming out. And um, we'll see you uh, uh, in September uh, for, uh, for when Katya uh, resumes uh, our series of First Friday lectures. <laughs> Goodbye, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Hey, Kendall, is it possible for me to download the chat so I can see what some of the other questions